Good morning. I trust that you're well. Indeed. Uh, I am well as well. Has the Lord been good to you? Have you been good to the Lord? No, maybe. You're trying? Not sure? As I've been introduced, John Agagwa is my name. I serve as one of the pastors at Mamlaka Hill Chapel. I have had the opportunity to serve as a youth minister uh, at the same church for a number of years. I think about um, six, seven or eight years. Um, and God has helped me through that whole process. But I was just thinking about it this morning as I was coming. And I think if we are speaking the truth, everyone in every minister in Kenya is to some extent a youth minister. Uh, because of just how young our country is uh, in terms of our mean age. Um, so so that's, that's, a, that's a great thing. It's an encouraging thing. I was asked to share with us on the subject of the centrality of the gospel in youth ministry. The centrality of the gospel in youth ministry. So if you're writing notes, that is the title. Uh, if you are pretending to write notes as you finish your grocery list, well, just write that there. Just uh, You don't confuse your neighbor. Um, yeah, the centrality of the gospel in youth ministry. Our main text is going to be in the book of Romans chapter 1 from verse 15 to verse 16. Romans chapter 1 from verse 15 to verse 16. These are two verses, I will read them. It says, so I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. I'll read that, I'll read that again, Romans 1, 15 to 16. So I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. Really appreciate the prayer time we've had in the morning. Um, we can never pray enough, so let's pray it again. Our Lord, we are grateful to you. I ask in much humility that it would please you to move me out of the way so that you will speak to your people. Pray that you bless each and every person that is represented here and edify us with your word. Father, I ask that what we are not, you will make us. What we know not, you will teach us. And what we have not, you will give us through the ministry of your word. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Allow me to begin with a question. I wonder what attracted you to youth ministry. Assuming a majority of us here are youth workers in one respect or the other, I wonder what attracted you to youth ministry. I have a few suggestions that I am absolutely sure did not attract you to youth ministry. The first one is the massive salary that youth ministers get uh, in this country. You are just thinking about what a huge salary I will get when I become a youth minister. It is very unlikely that that motivated any of us here because that is probably not the case. Here's what I also know is not the case. It is not the promise of feeling impressive when you meet with the people in family gathering and they ask you, what do you do for a living? And you're like, I always wanted to answer, I'm a youth worker. Very unlikely that that's the case. It's not likely that you are attracted to youth ministry because of its flexible hours and clear work-life balance. Because youth don't get problems at night and call you in the middle of the night. Their problems are just within eight to five, and you're like, boom, that's the kind of job I want. Beloved, if you're being honest, none of these things 
attracted you to youth ministry. If you have an ounce of integrity and sincerity in your ministry, you know that it is likely that you are driven to youth ministry because of the plight of the youth that you saw and sometimes, sadly, the lack of attention that is often given to that demographics. You see, the reality is that we joined youth ministry for many of us because we hoped to see God transform their lives. We hoped to see God use us in one way or the other to make the life of a youth teenager that's struggling with self-esteem better, that dealing with depression and sexual struggle to come out of their scene and walk in holiness and victory in God. You joined youth ministry likely because you hoped that in some way God will use you as an instrument to move them forward in their journey of sanctification. And so perhaps the most important thing about us that minister to the youth is therefore an accurate appraisal of what is the fundamental problem of those that we minister to, which is the youth. And this brings us back to our text, Romans chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. He says, therefore, he says, so I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Notice what Paul is saying here. He says, I am not ashamed of the power of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Is a good question. What is the main problem facing the youth today? What is the main problem facing the youth today? In fact, to make this a little bit more interactive, just ask the person seated next to you that question and hear their answer in one word. What is the main problem facing the youth today? Allow me to ask at this point, assuming the one word has been given, at the count of three, I'd like you to say what your neighbor said, uh, and so that we can say it all together. Who knows? Maybe we will be in agreement. Uh, so three, two, one, go. Lack of money is not one word. Okay. So let's go again. Three, two, one, go. Our text makes it clear that there is indeed a problem. He says that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The power of God unto salvation, the word salvation means rescue, it means deliverance, it means preservation, it means safety. These are not things you need if all is well. You, you, you don't live your life when all is well and you're like, oh my goodness, I need rescue. You only need rescue when things are not going well, when everything is not okay. And so the scripture is painting here a bleak picture of the state of humanity without God. We are a people that need rescue. The Bible will use other language, words like lost, perishing, disobedient by nature, under God's wrath, without God in the world to describe the desperate state of humanity apart from God. And therefore God says that the gospel is the power of God unto rescue humanity, unto the deliverance of humanity. Paul is implying together with all of scripture that something terrible has happened to mankind that necessitates the power of God to rescue him. Beloved, that problem manifests in many ways. Lack of money, depression, poverty, low self-esteem, corruption, no integrity, sexual struggle, and impurity. All those are manifestations of this one problem that the Bible identifies as sin. The genesis of this problem is found in, wait for it, Genesis. Where God made man. 
And in Genesis chapter 3, man decided to take the reins of his own life and determine for himself what was good and what was evil and ushered in sin that ushered in death and all the symptoms that are associated with it. But the greatest problem of sin is this, Romans chapter 1, right verse 18. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people. The big problem with sin is that it has incurred the wrath, the just wrath of God on all people. Because we have been alienated from God, we are, we are psychologically alienated within ourselves. We experience shame and fear. And we are also alienated from one another. We experience conflict and war. We are alienated from nature itself. Everything is broken down. Since the garden, we have lived in a world filled with suffering, disease, poverty, racism, natural disaster, war, aging, death. And it all stems from the wrath and curse that is on this world because of the sin of Eve and Adam. The world is indeed out of joint. And the gospel is true. We need rescue. We need salvation. And the question is this, how pervasive is the problem? Look at our text. I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Then he says, first to the Jew. And also to the Greek. You see, the Jews looked at the world in two big categories. Jews, descendants of Abraham, and others. In case you're wondering where you lie, you're in the others. That's how they looked at the world. And so this is Paul's way of saying that this problem of sin affects everyone. Jew and Greek, men and women, rich and poor. If you read the book of Acts, you will see that the gospel is addressed to all kinds of people. And that means that the problem that affects the rich is the problem that affects the poor. It is also the problem thus that affects the elderly and the problem that affects the youth. You see, the young people of today have exactly the same problem as their great-great-grandparents, Adam and Eve. Humanity has not fundamentally changed since those days. It is little wonder the scripture says there is nothing new under the sun. In other words, the same problem that affected Adam and Eve after the fall, the same problem that was affecting the Babylonians and the Chaldeans and the Sabaeans and all the Jebusites and the Gigasites and, and all those guys, are the same problems that affect you and I. They are the same problems that affect the youth today. And so when we experience the symptoms of, of sin, we must remember fundamentally that the underlying problem is sin. And so here's my question to you, dear youth worker. Does your diagnosis of the problem go as deep as God's diagnosis of the problem? Do you agree with God's diagnosis of the problem? Or are you trying to come up with creative ways to address new problems that have a reason. And so what is the God's solution? Well, this is important because what we believe is the main problem affecting the youth today will fundamentally shape how we go about ministry. Somebody has rightly said that theology drives methodology. This is just one way of saying that what you do in ministry reflects what you believe in ministry. And what you believe in ministry will show up in how you go about ministry. You see, many methods that have been chosen in Christian ministry are often times like painkillers numbing the symptoms of a disease. But the Bible is telling us today that only the gospel combats what the real issue is. Romans chapter 1, 15 to 16. I am eager to preach the good news to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation. Paul is saying here concerning the gospel, the absoluteness with which he is speaking. Paul is saying that the gospel, it is the power. He doesn't say the gospel is one of the ways that God saves. 
He doesn't say the gospel contains the power that God uses to save. No, he says it is the very power of God. The gospel is the very instrument that God uses to save and to sanctify sinners. His confidence of Paul is not in gimmicks or eloquence or methods to save sinners. His confidence is clearly in the gospel. It is evident that God has chosen the instrument of the gospel to save and to sanctify sinners. And my question to you, beloved youth worker, is this. Have you chosen the gospel? God has chosen it. But have you submitted to the choice of God? Is your confidence in something other than the gospel to save and sanctify the youth? Perish the thought. Is your confidence in programs and music and elephants on stage? Perish the thought. Beloved, the presence of these things does not mean that we have put our confidence in them, even though the elephants on stage will be a bit suspicious. But at our hearts, we know what we have put our trust in. There is nothing wrong in using the means that God has given us. If anything, the book of Colossians says that all things have been made for Christ. All things were made for Christ. In other words, everything that God created finds its ultimate fulfillment when it's used for the purposes of Christ. When I was younger, there used to be a debate as to which genre of music was godly and which genre of music was not. And the truth is, the devil didn't create any music. All things were made by God. And so as to how it is used, that's up to men. But the ultimate purpose of all that God has made is to be found in its use in the gospel. So the problem is not to use all the things and the means that God has given us. The problem lies in the heart and you must answer this at a personal level. Do you believe that the power lies in the methods or do you believe that the power lies in the gospel? The Bible tells us the power lies in the gospel word. Isaiah chapter 55 says that my word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish all that he sends it to do. It is God's word that accomplishes all that God sends it to do. The scripture says in another place that God is watching over his word to perform it. What is God watching over to perform? His word. In other words, when the youth gather in your ministry on Sunday, on Wednesday, on Friday, on Thursday, whatever day they meet, after the session is over, you know what God is watching over to perform? His word. Not our stories, not the entertainment, not the wonderful things we said. God is wondering and God is looking at, okay, how much of my word was proclaimed? And that's what he's watching over to perform. Beloved, remember the words of our Lord Jesus. They said, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, even if a man be raised from the dead, they will not hear. They will not turn. This is what Jesus is saying. If they don't respond to the word of the gospel as revealed in scripture, they will not respond even if you bring the best music, the hippest dressing, and elephants on stage. Thus, beloved, give them. Moses and the prophets. Because if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, then they will not be saved. Perhaps you're here and you might be thinking, this emphasis on the gospel assumes that we all, all we do is evangelism. We, we, we also do discipleship faster. Please give us the heavy duty, meaty stuff for discipleship. The gospel is the milk by which we come in. Thank you for that. Now give us the meat by which we shall grow. Oh no, but I fear that this is the attitude of many believers today. They look at gospel message as the basics, as the ABC of Christianity. And they look at other doctrines as the, the A to Z. Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, maybe a few things could be further from the truth. But do you consider that Paul is writing the book of Romans to believers? 
And it is to believers that he is telling that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is God's power to save. That word salvation is a big word. It is the whole process of salvation. It is salvation from sin, which is what happens when you come into Christ. It is salvation. It is the sanctification process that encompasses the journey of salvation. It is the justification that happens when you become a Christian. It's the glorification that happens at the end of time. Everything that pertains to salvation is in that word. And Paul is saying the gospel is the power of God that saves sinners, that sanctifies saints, and ultimately that will glorify saints. It is by the gospel that initially we are saved from the penalty of sin. It is by the gospel that we are currently being saved from the power of sin. It is by the gospel that we will eventually be saved from the presence of sin. It is all the gospel. It is inaccurate, beloved, to think that the gospel is the thing that saves the Christian, and then we need other principles to move on in the journey of sanctification. Sometimes we think of the gospel as the springboard in a swimming pool, upon which when we dive in, that's the gospel, and then there is more to dive into the swimming pool. And I think that that's a little bit misguided. The reality is that the gospel is the swimming pool. There is so much to explore in it as we dive in the gospel, then we begin to realize that that's the means that God uses not only to save sinners, but also to sanctify saints. It is little wonder that much of the instructions that are given to us in the New Testament are tied to the gospel. When Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, in Corinth and he told them about giving, he could have told them, give because God has commanded. But he says, give because you remember the grace of God in the gospel. That though he was poor, I mean, though he was rich, he became poor. That we, through his poverty, might be rich. The commandment is tied to the gospel. The commandment to sexual purity is tied to the gospel. He says, you that are united with Christ, how shall you take your body and unite it with that of somebody else that's not a Christian? Every time we are given instructions in the scriptures, they are tied to the gospel because Paul understands that even our sanctification is driven by the gospel. Somebody has rightly said that the gospel is not like a springboard that causes us to jump into other truth. It is actually the hub upon which all truth turns. And therefore, beloved, it is true that the problem of the youth is essentially the problem of adults. It is sin. And that is why we must take this ministry very seriously. And so let me ask you this question. The youth that come to your church, if they were asked, What's the one thing if we remove from this church, you will stop coming? I don't know what they would say. Perhaps they might say, if you get rid of the smoke machine, you will never see me again. Or they may say, if you change the music, you won't see me again. Or they say, if you remove the camps and the fan, you won't see me again. But you know what answer you're really looking for? If you dilute the gospel, if you change the message, you will never see me again. That's how you know that you have been teaching them the truth. That everything else is there and it's wonderful, but the central things must remain central. So here is a word to those of us who serve in churches. The souls of the youth are just as important to God as the souls of the adults. Their sins are just as grievous to God as the sins of the adults. If they are left unsaved, they will go to the same hell that adults will go to. There is no torn down teen friendly hell. 
Therefore, we must treat youth ministry with as much seriousness as we treat all other ministry. Do not be here and think as a youth worker that this is just a, a stepping stone to, to where I really want to be in ministry. Beloved, you're dealing with the weighty, eternal souls of men. And God will call us to account one of these fine days. And so you might be thinking, Pastor, are you saying that there is no distinction whatsoever? That the gospel we minister to the adults is the gospel that we minister to the youth? Emphatically, yes. In the book of Acts, there are several groups that are addressed. Jews, Bible believers, peasants, polytheists, uh, sophisticated pagans, Christian elders, hostile Jews, governing elites, poor, rich men, women. And yet at all points that the gospel is presented, the message is unchanged. The message remains the same. Their problem is all the same. Sin, their solution is all the same. The gospel. There is no distinction in the problem or in the message. And yet there is a difference in the presentation of this same gospel. Some, call, some scholars have called this what you might call contextualization. Consider this text that we have read from verse 16. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power to salvation, for salvation for all who believe. Then he says, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. You see, Paul could have simply said, everyone who believes and stopped there. He could have said it is the power of God of everyone who believes and he would have stopped there. After all, the Jews and Gentiles are included in that phrase. But Paul understands contextualization. And Paul says, yes, it affects everyone. But amongst this everyone, there are Jews. And there are Gentiles. And they are culturally different. Beloved, we must not ignore our context and setting. We must seriously reflect upon our culture so that our gospel ministry engages and connects with the youth culture. That's what contextualization is all about. I appreciate a book by Tim Keller called Center Church where he describes contextualization as translating and adapting the communication and ministry of the gospel to a particular culture without compromising the essence and particulars of that very gospel itself. In the great, the great youth minister's task is to express this same gospel to a youth culture in a way that avoids making the message unnecessarily alien to the youth, yet without removing or obscuring the essential message of the gospel. You see, many ministers are even afraid of the word contextualization because they feel once you use that word, you're just using a smart word to try and sneak in things into the church that you know you should not sneak in. And maybe they are right to be concerned to a certain level about it. But the truth is this, everyone contextualizes. Once you choose a language, you've contextualized. Once you speak in English, there are several people that immediately cannot understand you because of the language that you have chosen. Everybody contextualizes. The truth is this, contextualization is inevitable. Thus, it is important to contextualize consciously. Every one of us does it. So here's the advice that I will see from this text. Firstly, is the starting point. The reason that much concern is raised over this word is because for many people, the, especially in youth ministry circles, the starting point is off. Here is how most youth ministers attempted to start out the question of contextualizing the gospel. They will say something like, what do the youth of today want? And then once we answer that question, we begin to fill the services with those things. I'd like to propose that if our ministry is going to be gospel-centered, our first question should not be what the youth want. Our first question should be what God wants. Why? Because we are first and foremost servants of God. And therefore, our youth ministry is first and foremost a service to God. And so the question we need to ask ourselves is this. What does God want? 
And God answers that question in the gospel. And once we understand and conceptualize the gospel and be like, this is what the gospel is, this is the message of the gospel, we can go on understanding from the message of the gospel and creating methods that fit in what the problems our people face but are driven by the gospel. And so what God desires of you and I is this, gospel-driven, people-oriented methods. It's gospel-driven. It begins from the gospel, but it's oriented to the youth because there is a context that we minister in. You see, this is something you and I know intuitively, that the message has to determine the method, right? For instance, it is generally frowned upon to break up with someone via text. This generally speaking. It is frowned upon. It is preferred to meet the person in person. You see, you can't argue that, but I passed the message. Everybody will be like, you broke up with them via text? And you're like, yeah, but we met on WhatsApp. No, it doesn't matter. You know, it's generally improper also to inform somebody of tragic news over the phone, right? You want to meet them in person. Make sure they are seated. And also our demeanor in communication matters. Heavy duty news should be communi- shouldn't be communicated with glee. In as much as celebratory news should not be communicated with somberness. If your friend declared a fast and refused to eat and called you to a meeting and said with his hand across his cheek, I want you to pray with me. So what's the issue? I just started dating. (laughs) You would be properly concerned because you don't expect that kind of news to be to be to be communicated that kind of way intuitively you and i understand that the message must determine the method the method is not completely free from the message in much the same way beloved the message of the gospel must determine the method that the gospel is propagated with it must convey the seriousness that we are dealing with the souls of men that one day, one million years from now, they will either be in eternal bliss or eternal damnation. And whatever methods we choose, because God has given us freedom to choose, they must never betray the message. And so the only way to, to do this, the only way to, to contextualize properly is this. To allow the gospel to determine the, mes- the method. And so we don't start with the question of what does the youth of today want? We begin with what is the message of the gospel? What does God say? What does God want? And so here's my question to you, dear youth worker. Do you understand the gospel deeply enough for you to contextualize it for the youth that God has sent your way? It is only after we have satisfactorily answered this question and understood this, that the message of the gospel and the problem of sin and the solution of the gospel of God, are we ready to ask the question concerning the culture? So here's the next question then we must ask. How is the problem of sin specifically manifesting in the, in the youth in my region? What are the false hopes and solutions that they have believed in? How can, we be pre- how can we present the gospel in a way that is thus relevant to the sins that they are struggling with? And the only way to do this is to be deeply immersed with the youth in their culture, enough to understand their nuances, their narratives, and their hopes. Consider Paul, for example. Paul contextualizes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 20, he says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of his age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? Verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Verse 22. For God, for the Jews demand signs and and the Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Do you realize what Paul is saying? He's saying for the Jews demand signs. 
And the Greek seeks wisdom. He says the Jews want power. He says the Greeks want wisdom. Paul had so distilled the culture in his day that he understood the cultural narrative of the Jews and he understood the cultural narrative of the Greeks. He was able to say in one statement, this is what the Jews want. And in another statement, this is what the, the, the Greeks want. And my question to you is this, have you understood the culture of those that God has brought your way, their hopes and their narratives, so that you can distill it to one sentence? And because Paul could, he could easily apply the gospel to both. And by the way, this reminds me that God has always been making statements like this. Now, that doesn't mean that every single Jew wanted power, and that doesn't mean that every single Jew sought, every single Greek sought wisdom. Paul is speaking, generically speaking, we know we live in a day and age that general speaking is frowned upon. We are told, don't say stuff like, Kenyans are. Say, some Kenyans are. Because I am a Kenyan, and I do not fit what you're saying. Well, but the truth is, God has always been speaking like that. Didn't you read the scriptures? The Bible says that the scripture says that the Jews rejected the gospel. But we know that it's not every single Jew that rejected the gospel. And yet God's testimony is that the nation of Israel rejected the gospel. When Paul was writing to, to Titus, he said to him, Cretans are all lazy brutes and liars. Now we know that not every single Cretan was a lazy brute and a liar. I mean, Titus was one of them and Paul is not telling Titus that he's a lazy brute and a liar. The Bible actually gives us freedom to speak like that. So it's okay sometimes to say Kenyans are. We know it's not every single Kenyan, but as a nation. That's what sometimes we are. That's besides the point. But do you understand the youth that God has brought away enough to say, the youth in this area, this is how they are like. Beloved, contextualization is not as sometimes has been made to seem it's not giving people what they want to hear no look at this example paul said the jews want power the greeks want wisdom what does paul give them the gospel he gives them the cross the cross to the jew is ultimate weakness what sort of messiah is this that comes and dies and to the greek who wants wisdom what sort of foolishness is this me to be saved by somebody that was crucified on the, on the cross? Did you notice how Paul, understanding the culture, he doesn't necessarily immediately begin to adapt to it. He confronts it. But did you also notice how Paul immediately also affirms that culture and says, yeah, yeah, Jews, I know what you're looking for is power. And I know that at first glance, the cross looks like weakness. But have you considered that it is through the cross that God has ultimately done the most powerful thing ever in defeating death and sin? And G Greeks, I know that what you're seeking is wisdom. And at first glance, the cross looks foolish. But have you considered that God has done the wisest thing in both satisfying justice and love on the cross? And he says, yes, I know you're seeking power, and the cross doesn't look like, like, like it's power, but it is ultimate power. And yes, I know that you're seeking wisdom, and the cross doesn't look like it's wisdom, and it's ultimately wisdom. Paul both confronts and affirms the culture with the gospel. And I wonder whether you and I understand the gospel enough to confront the youth, but at the same time to affirm the youth, because the gospel often does both to the culture. So here's a word of warning. After we talk much like this about contextualization, it's possible for us to believe that that's where the power lies. Beloved, it is not. The power lies in the gospel. The power doesn't lie in how well we are able to contextualize. The power lies in the very gospel that we proclaim and preach. The gospel is the most countercultural way to win the culture. Notice. God knew the Jews wanted power. God knew the Greeks wanted wisdom. And yet he gave both the cross. 
Have you ever considered the thief at the cross? If you want to understand the basics of the gospel, the very tenets of the gospel, what the gospel can be reduced completely to, look at the thief on the cross. That guy never attended a Bible study that we know of. He did not know systematic theology. He had never read biblical theology. He was not a certified member of any church. And he admitted, he told the other guy, we are thieves, we know. He said, stop speaking to this good man like that. You and I are thieves. He admitted his fault. So he was not falsely accused. And yet the brother showed up in heaven. Must have been a surprise to many people. You know, I always tell people heaven will surprise many of us. The brother showed up. Like, I think I had a minister recently on one of these YouTube shots saying, I wonder what the angel asked him. He says, okay, how are you here? I think the brother is probably asking, where is here? <laughs> I don't know that he had ever heard the doctrine of the gospel or of heaven. All he knew was a kingdom. He didn't know what that kingdom should look like. And he was like, where is here? And the angel is like, this is heaven. Oh, heaven. And the angel is like, okay, so... Do you, okay, do you know anything about justification? And he's like, just the what now? Okay, 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 tell me a bit about uh, uh, maybe sanctification. Do you, do you know, know a bit about that? Santi who now? He's like, okay, just, just help me understand. Why should I let you in? And he sort of moves like this and he sees that man. And he says, because that man said I can come. That's the essence of the gospel. And I want you to think about it. This guy, this guy had no reason. He didn't have as much reason as you and I to believe in Jesus. As far as he was concerned, Jesus was the least attractive on that cross. There was no miracle Jesus was performing. He was dying. He was naked. He was crucified. And yet in that moment, God saw something in a man's heart by which he could be saved. Beloved, God can strip us of our music. He can strip us of our methods. He can strip us of our smoke machines. He can strip us of anything and leave us only with a grass and a small tent and a thorned acacia brew, a, a thorned acacia tree and still save souls. Because ultimately, when everything else has been completely removed, the power that remains to save is not in how great we contextualize, but is in the message of the gospel that we proclaim. And you and I must understand that no youth in our ministry is saved because of the wonderful, nice things we do. Thank God for them, don't get me wrong. But we must always remember that the power does not lie there. The power lies in the message. And so you might ask as I conclude, what is that message? What is that gospel? Paul says, I am eager to preach the good news. The first thing about the gospel is that it is a news. It is not advice. It is a news. There is a considerable difference between the two. A news is when a king went to battle and they won the battle and they sent a messenger to go tell the people, you can relax. The battle has been won. That's news. Of course, news has implications. One of the implications as is indicated in the message is that you can relax. If I was gearing myself up for colonization, I can now be, oh, colonization will not happen. We are free. But the gospel is essentially news. In verse 15, it reveals about salvation as we've talked about. It's news that God has rescued you and I, that God has saved you and I. That's the gospel. It is being rescued. The gospel is not every single item the Bible teaches. It is the news that God has saved us from sin and wrath. It is not a code of ethics to be followed. It's not a list of principles to be adhered to. Though it, proper, it properly grounds ethics and principles, it is none of this. It is news. 
It is good news. The gospel is a news report about how we have been rescued from peril. What peril? Beloved, this is what the gospel is. Is that God has saved us from his own wrath. You know, when I was growing up, I always assumed that God has saved us like from the devil, like the devil was going to torment us. And then now God has saved us from the devil. But the reality is this. Salvation is that God has saved us from his own wrath. Salvation is by God, for God, from God. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, that he has saved us from the wrath that is to come. That's what the gospel is. And remember the book of Hebrews, beloved, the scripture says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for the Son of Man did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. But everyone who does not believe is condemned already. In other words, the wrath of God abides on him, for he has not believed in the Son of Man that is to come. Beloved, salvation is salvation from the wrath of God. And here's the terrifying thing about the wrath of God. It is forever. It's not that God will one day be like, okay, these guys have suffered for a million years, they've learned their lesson. No, the Bible calls it eternal damnation. It is to continue in absolute suffering forever and ever and ever and ever. Beloved, why do we do youth ministry? Why do we preach? Because of this. Because one day God will require accountability and every soul will be asked by God. And the Bible says it is better to lose the whole world and to save your soul than to gain the whole world and to lose your soul. And so imprint this in the hearts of those that God has brought your way. Let them know their biggest problem is not their self-esteem. Let them know that their biggest problem is not their sexual struggle. Let them know their biggest problem is not their confusion about their career choice. Let them know their biggest problem is not about how to get a degree for a little bit of safety. Somebody rightly said that you and I, all of us are on a world stage and we are standing on a trap door that one of these fine days will open and it will sink us six feet, up, six feet under. And on that day, there will either be two things, either absolute nothingness or the everlasting arms of a loving God. There is nothing in this world that will give you security from that except the gospel. And blessed is the man that walks this earth, this earth a sweeper, who nobody thinks much of, but believes the gospel. Then be a CEO who everyone praises and acclaims and believe not the gospel. Because in the end, when we stand before God, I pray that we will be like Paul to say, that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Because ultimately it is the power of God to save. And so would you go forth and make the gospel the central thing in the life of those that God has given you to minister to? Make it central. Because ultimately the gospel is central. The gospel is central because it is the power of God to save sinners. The gospel is central because it is ultimately the means by which God will use to save and sanctify the youth that he has brought your way. What is the gospel? It is that Jesus Christ has come and paid the price that you and I could not pay. Hanging on that cross, he took on himself the wrath of God and he cried out, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? Because upon him was laid the sins of the world because God so loved the world so deeply. 
And you and I, like the thief on that cross, will show up in heaven, not because of our wonderful understanding of systematic theology and our proper doctrinal statements, but because we'll, God will ask us, why should I let you into my heaven? I pray that your answer and the answer of all those youth that God brings away will not be for anything else except to sort of move a little bit past the angel who asks and say, because that man said I can come. Let us pray. Our Lord, we are grateful for the gospel. We pray that you will teach us to minister that gospel to those that you have brought our way. And we pray that you will teach us to see and to understand that ultimately the power to save and to sanctify lies in the message of the gospel around which all things must be central. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. God bless you.